Recording in progress. Good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Economics and Ateneo for Economics Research and Development Seminar Series. Um, we hold this series like twice a month every Wednesday and this semester this is the last seminar that we're going to have. Um, for those of you who have just come in, let me just remind everyone of our house rules. Okay, We will let the speaker finish her presentation first before we entertain questions. Zoom participants, Kindly stay muted and stop sharing your video during the duration of the presentation. During Q&A, you may um, virtually raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged, and you may unmute and show yourself when asking your questions. You may also write your questions already on the chat box in case you uh, want, just to make sure that you don't forget your questions. We also have participants on Facebook. You may post your questions in the comment sections. And we will prioritize asking the questions in natural resource economics, invasive species management, and watershed management, particularly for Hawaii and Pacific. Kimberly's publication and extramural grants have focused on invasive species and watershed management, groundwater management, and the value of watershed conservation. She is here with us to present her research, Mountain to Sea Ecological Resource Management. Um, please help me welcome Kimberly Burnett. Kim, the screen is yours. Thank you, Maha. Let me share. I'm not nearly as quick as you, but here it goes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Everyone? Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's fun to be here in such a organized seminar series. I think this is definitely the most organized seminar series I've been a part of. So thank you for the invitation, Maha. Um, 
So today I'm going to talk about Mountain to Sea Ecological Resource Management. Um, this is a project with my two co-authors, um, Chris Wada, who led the project, and Sididaj Ponjis Farasin, um, who is um, in Thailand. And unfortunately, neither of them are here today, but I'll do my best to tell the story. So this is them. This is Chris and Pap. Um, when we were in Japan about two years ago, this is the first time we presented this work um, at a conference in Tokyo. Okay, so just to introduce the project, um, this was actually a part of a larger five-year National Science Foundation funded project. Um, and the Hawaiian name of it was Ikewai, which means in English, knowledge of water. So Ike is like knowledge and Y is water. Um, and we're actually just finishing up this five-year project this year, but it, so this is kind of the overview of the larger project. It was a very large interdisciplinary um, endeavor with many different departments, many more than just economics. Um, so there were people from the geophysics department, microbiology, coastal hydrology, geochemistry, um, and all kinds of different departments. And the kind of big picture was we were looking at answering a variety of stakeholder questions about basically water management in Hawaii. Um, we looked in two different study sites on Oahu and also the Big Island. And the idea was to think about how to manage groundwater with a lot of different associated linkages in mind. Um, so we had, we kind of started the project in the first year by going out to the agencies and to the community and asking what the kind of big picture questions regarding groundwater and water management were. And then using those questions, we then tried to set up models from all of these different disciplines, including economics, to try to answer those questions. Um, and then ultimately, of course, with the goal of informing management and doing a better job managing water. And so these photos at the bottom just kind of show that process where, you know, we really tried to make sure that the research was addressing real world needs in Hawaii about groundwater. So some of the big questions that came up with some of the agencies in Hawaii um, there were two main sets that I'm going to talk about in this project. One was thinking about how to manage groundwater with all of these different considerations. So, for example, um, protecting customary Hawaiian rights. So whether that's um, gathering limu, which is a, a native Hawaiian type of seaweed. Um, so there's there's all of this variety of fish and wildlife that Native Hawaiians would gather before that they need to, we need to protect um, those rights. And so how do you manage groundwater in a way that is respectful of that? Um, also just fish and wildlife, any fish and wildlife that depends on the groundwater resource, we need to make sure that we're managing while thinking about the health and preservation of those, that fish and wildlife. Um, maintaining ecological balance and, and beauty, and then finally preserving and enhancing waters of the state. So these four um, responsibilities are actually in our state water code in Hawaii. Um, but the problem is the way we currently manage groundwater doesn't necessarily take all of these four considerations explicitly in mind. And so part of the big objective of this project was to try to directly integrate these considerations. Um, and then the second major component that we look at in this work is thinking about watershed conservation. And I'll explain what I mean by that later, but it's basically thinking about protecting the forest in order to actually protect the groundwater resource. And so depending on how healthy your upstream um, forest is, that can change the availability of water downstream. And so another agency in Hawaii, the Department of Water Supply was actually looking to us to understand better where they should be investing in protecting the forest and how much they should be investing in protecting the forest. So not only kind of where to build fences and how to protect the forest, but how much they should be investing in that um, 
in that endeavor to protect the water. And so in the first year of that five-year project, we actually got a lot of really good feedback in terms of what are the correct questions we should be asking for this research. Okay, so in order to try to answer those questions, um, we needed to develop a framework that connected on water dependent ecosystems is what it's often referred to now in, in a lot of recent literature, um, how to connect preserving the forest and how that's connected to the aquifer or the availability of groundwater, which is used for both you know, drinking and agriculture and um, any domestic water use. We pump it, but then also as it's in underground, it provides um, basically the health of this groundwater dependent ecosystem. So different species not only need to live in the, in the ocean, but they need a certain amount of fresh water coming out. And so if you draw the aquifer down too much, you're gonna actually, um, potentially lose some of your, your groundwater dependent ecosystems that are dependent on that fresh water. And so that trade-off is what we're considering here. You know, investing in the forest, that will actually protect your water, which then enhances the availability of fresh water for the ecosystems offshore. So that's the kind of big picture story. Whoops. Okay. Um, these are just some of the questions that a model like this enables us to answer um, that came up a lot with our stakeholders that, you know, they were asking us to help them address. So what is the benefit of watershed management? In other words, if we're spending money protecting the forest through building fences, removing wild animals that disturb the forests, um, how does that help us reduce the future cost of managing groundwater? Um, and then are we able to use this model to actually monetize the benefit of protecting those ecosystems that are dependent on groundwater? So is there a way to use this model to say, all of these species that depend on the groundwater are worth this much to us because basically we're willing to trade off spending more on either desalinizing water or protecting the forest in order to protect them. So this is the kind of trade-offs we're thinking about in this model. Um, again, how much to invest in watershed management. So can we actually help managers understand, you know, if you spend a million dollars in this particular area, you're going to get this much back in future groundwater benefits. Um, and then finally, what factors actually are going to change that answer? So what factors influence how much we should be spending on protecting the forest? So for example, how, how, what degree of protection are we affording the groundwater dependent ecosystems? And I'll, and I'll go through some examples of what I mean by the GDEs in the next slides. Um, is protecting the forest in actually increasing the amount of groundwater that's available. So all of these factors are going to influence the optimal level of investment. Um, and they're going to vary a lot by place um, and a lot by type of aquifer. But what we do in this work is try to kind of do a baseline case. And then we do some sensitivity analysis to see how sensitive all of the parameters are to um, how much we change these, these various factors. Okay, so this is the study site that we look at. Um, this is, it's on the west side of the big island of Hawaii. So this is the southernmost island in the chain. Um, it's actually very well known for groundwater and groundwater coming out particularly near the coast. And so I don't know if any of you have actually been to Hawaii or visited the Big Island, but one of the things you'll definitely notice if you have, if you get in the water here, the temperature changes a lot when you're in the water. And the reason is because a lot of the cold water coming out is actually fresh and it's seeping in through this volcanic rock. And so, you know, when we talk about groundwater dependent ecosystems, a lot of these species, it's, it's the native seaweeds, it's seagrasses, um, it needs 
a lower salinity. So it needs fresh water to be coming out in order to support its population. So what happens is if you over extract from the aquifer, you're gonna lose that discharge to the ocean, which will then in turn affect your ecosystems. And so that's why this place is very good for studying um, this question. Okay, so um, for the overall framework, we need to characterize two different linkages. Um, the first is the forest to the aquifer, right? So that's the first linkage that we've talked about. So the upstream, how that is related, how the health of the forest is related to how much water is recharging the aquifer every year. That's the first linkage. And how does this work? Um, you know, why does the forest affect availability of groundwater? It's because if you don't protect it, what ends up happening is you have a lot of invasive species coming in, whether it's um, ungulates, so these like pigs or deer or goats basically coming in and trampling and um, making these pig wallows, you know, making big um, muddy holes that don't allow the water to to go into the aquifer, instead it will run off. Um, that's one problem. So you want to kind of try to get rid of these, these animals to, to protect the forest in order to get more recharge. Um, also the kinds of plants that are in the forest are gonna change the amount of water that's available. And so um, on the left, you see some um, invasive species to Hawaii, so species that are not native here that actually change the ability of the forest to capture water. So as you can see, the guava stands in the top left, they grow really tall and basically nothing can grow under them, um, which doesn't allow as much water to be captured. And so less is going to go on the ground and subsequently then to the marine ecosystem. Also ginger on the um, bottom left is also kind of a, you know, monotypic in that nothing else can grow there and it just changes the ability of the forest to capture water. Unlike something like Ohia on the right, which is native, it has a variety of different shapes and levels and it's much better at capturing water. Um, there's a lot of other evidence that native versus invaded forests are better at collecting water. So fog interception is something that hydrologists have studied. Um, native trees are a little bit better at, at, at capturing the fog and actually allowing the fog to then drip down eventually into the aquifer and recharge it. Um, and again, there's a lot of agreement that when you have a native understory or native plants in the forest, you're going to have more recharging than running off. And so basically the idea is how much should we be investing in protecting from these animals and protecting from the invasive plants? so that we can have a more intact native forest to capture water and recharge the aquifer. So that's the first linkage. The second is regarding the connection between the aquifer and the groundwater dependent ecosystems. And so that's the second arrow. Um, so basically how much water is underground, it's gonna be, it, it's, a, it's a renewable resource, right? So it's growing and it's, there's a stock that depends on both natural rainfall, but also that the health of the forest. And depending on how much we withdraw every year, but also how much is being put back in through rainfall and the health of the forest, some amount of that will seep out into the groundwater, depend, um, into the near shore. And that will affect the health of the groundwater dependent ecosystems. And so that's the second linkage we wanna characterize. So when I, I've been talking about these groundwater dependent ecosystems, and there's a lot of different examples, but from this study, a couple of specific examples, this shrimp looking guy in the upper left, this is called Opaiula, and it's a native shrimp species. And so again, this is part of the, wa the state water code is protecting native, um, native bugs, native insects, native animals, um, native everyone from basically, if, if it needs groundwater, we need to help protect it. But how do you do that through groundwater management? The um, upper right is a damselfly, another um, protected native 
insect to Hawaii that again depends on this groundwater to survive. And so, and then the bottom, the bottom right is actually um, from this island, from the island of Oahu. That's a watercress farm, and that's not part of this particular study, but it's another example of how um, spring-fed or groundwater systems support um, these ecosystems. So this is a completely spring-fed um, watercress farm on the island of Oahu, which we also looked at, but not particularly in this paper. And then I mentioned before that if you've been to Hawaii and you've been in the ocean, you can actually feel the groundwater because it's colder. And so this picture is actually taken from above and it's a thermal infrared image of where the cold water is. And so that really blue water means it's really cold. So our study site is actually where the bluest water is. Um, so this is just kind of giving you an idea of how much fresh water can actually vary across the coastline and, and how basically changing the forest cover can change the av availability of that water. Okay, so that's the big picture of all of the linkages and the different systems that we're trying to link. Um, now this is going more into the uh, nuts and bolts of the model. And so thinking about describing each of those linkages um, using data from this aquifer in this area. And so the first thing we need to describe is the, the groundwater system itself. So how does the amount of groundwater change depending on natural recharge, so that's R, um, so rainfall, precipitation, um, discharge, which is how much is coming out into the ocean, which we've talked about, to that supports the groundwater dependent ecosystems. And then finally, it also depends on how much we're extracting or how much we're pumping every year. So the, the resource will change as a function of natural recharge, discharge into the ocean, and finally um, extraction of groundwater for domestic and other uses. Now, what about the recharge function? So this is kind of, central to the whole problem is how the health of the forest and investing in protecting the forest is going to change the amount of recharge because that then affects the amount of, of groundwater stock that's available. Um, and so the idea here is while when we invest in fencing and protecting the forest, um, our recharge is going to go up, but the more that we invest, it's going to be increasing at a decreasing rate. And so because, I mean, as you can kind of see in these photos, um, it's, a, it, it's a pretty hard endeavor to protect some of these places because as you can see, it's, on, it's often at very high elevations, it's very steep. So you're going to protect the kind of the best places first where you get the highest amount of recharge back. So the highest areas, the wettest areas, so the more that you protect, you're going to get more recharge, but every additional acre that you protect is going to give you a lower benefit. And so that's what this next um, figure shows is just that, you know, as you increase the, the acres protected, you're, you're starting with the most productive recharge areas. So higher elevations, more rainfall, more fog, so more natural um, precipitation and recharge. And then gradually, as you protect more, you're just going to be, you know, getting less and less productive as far as your capture area. So just as kind of an aside, we don't include this directly in the model, but it's a very interesting way that we also do watershed protection in Hawaii that I wanted to mention. Um, so aside from building fences to protect the native forests, there's also been a new technology developed called herbicide ballistic technology. And they actually go up in helicopters and shoot um, the bad plants. So the invasive species with these tiny little paintballs. So you, you see the little purple pellet. They put, it's not paint, not like the game, the kids game, but it's actually herbicide. And so they can direct herbicide right on the bad plants that they wanna get rid of um, and it allows, basically, you know, you can target your, your efforts without disturbing the rest of the forest. And so this is a really 
promising new technology that's actually pretty low cost aside from the flight time. So the flight time is what's expensive, but once they're up there, they can actually protect a lot of recharge. And so this is a, another project that we're working on looking at the efficiency of using helicopters for some of this watershed conservation. It's really interesting. Um, so some of the other parameters we needed are things like, you know, when the fresh water is coming out near shore, how does that change um, the growth of the important species that you're protecting? Um, and then how does salinity change as you have more or less water in the aquifer? Because remember, the more water you have in the aquifer, the more pressure is on that same amount of fresh water and the fresh water will then be pushed out to the near shore, lowering salinity and potentially increasing the rate of the important species that you're trying to protect. So in our particular project, we, we use this um, native Hawaiian limu or native Hawaiian um, seaweed that is used for a lot of different things. It's used, it's edible. Um, it's used again for just native Hawaiian collection. Um, and it's kind of like an indicator or keystone species saying how healthy that area is because not only is it used commercially, it's also, it also supports other endangered species such as the uh, green Hawaiian sea turtle. So the sea turtle eats this particular seaweed. So if we don't have enough seaweed, we also won't have enough, you know, as many turtles. And so it's kind of like an indicator species and that's the one we use in this particular paper. Um, all of the other equations are related to the cost of extracting groundwater, um, the cost of the fencing. So all of these things will change the optimal um, investment in watershed conservation and also the optimal um, extraction of groundwater over time. The control oh. variables are how much we're extracting every year, how much we're desalinating every year, and then how much we should be investing in protecting the forest. Um, the state variables are the stock of groundwater itself, but also the stock of fence. So how much you're investing in the fence will change how much is being protected every year. And then as far as constraints, how we measure how protect groundwater dependent ecosystem of interest. So just to kind of jump straight to the key result of this model. Um, so on the left is the situation before we have watershed conservation. So basically what this graph is saying, it's, it's a, it's the path of extraction over time and the difference in the benefit with and without that consideration of the groundwater dependent ecosystem. So the orange line is an unconstrained run of the model. So over 50 years, the net present value of the groundwater is $282.8 million. Now, as soon as we put our baseline growth constraint related to the the protected limo species, um, that extraction path drops a lot. And it's gonna drop to about in present value terms, a difference in about $12 million, okay? And so that's if you don't do any kind of investment in protecting the forest. Now on the right is what if we do the investment in, in watershed conservation? And what you can see is that we actually can mitigate a lot of the loss from protecting the groundwater dependent ecosystem through fencing. And of course, the net present value or economic benefit is gonna be slightly lower than the non-constrained case. And that's because you have to pay for the fencing. But the point is that you can mitigate a lot of the loss from protecting the ecological system by doing optimal investment in fencing or watershed protection. Um, so the next table kind of shows the optimal fence size over a range um, of costs. And so, you know, part of the problem with doing this is how much it, it costs to build a fence really depends on many things, including the terrain. Um, if there's already a fence there or if you're starting from nothing. So when we talked to all of the watershed conservation managers, it was really hard for them to kind of tell us, you know, it's this many dollars per year. And then every five years, you have to go out and fix a post. And every, you know, 25 years, you have to replace a whole section. 
there were all of these variations. And so we realized we needed to kind of, we, we took kind of the, the most likely, most common cost, but then also varied and looked at how, basically how the answer would change depending on um, how much it costs to do the fence. And so this is just for the baseline case of $75 per foot um, for 50 years, this is the, the kind of first year installation size and then the benefit over 50 years. And as you can see, if the price goes up too much, then it no longer becomes, uh, becomes efficient to do any fencing. And so it's kind of not worth it in terms of saved groundwater to build a fence. And there are definitely cases in which it may be too expensive because it's either too high or too hard to get to or too um, hard to maintain over time. So that's very valuable information for managers. Um, the next picture is optimal extraction for uh, a range of fence costs. Okay, so again, as you increase the cost of the fence, your extraction path is going to change. So the more expensive the fence is, um, the lower your extraction path is going to be. Oops. Where am I? Okay. And then the last few slides, I'm almost there, um, is just looking at sensitivity analysis for a lot of the different important parameters that were involved in the model. And so, you know, I mentioned that the way we considered the, the groundwater dependent ecosystem that's dependent on the amount of water coming out, which is again, dependent on the aquifer, which is dependent on the forest, we used a constraint. So we said, our, our baseline is 1.8. Um, now, if we make that stricter, say we can't let the limu grow less than 2%, um, then it's optimal, and this is the picture on the left, to actually fence more because you're being stricter about how much limu or how much um, seaweed is going to be there. If you're less strict about the ecological constraint, um, this is kind of like a safe minimum standard. If you decrease that, then the optimal fence level goes down. So depending on how strict you are about your ecological constraint, your amount of fencing that is optimal will change um, kind of in an intuitive way. Okay, for the recharge function, this just means how effective um, fencing and protecting the forest actually is in changing recharge. Um, and so, on the left, you can see our optimal fenced area as a function of fencing costs. So as your fencing, as your recharge increases, um, sorry, as your recharge goes down, you have to fence more. And as your recharge goes up, it's more efficient at capturing water. And so you can fence less also the intuitive way that you, what you would expect. And then the final um, sensitivity analysis we did was about demand growth. Um, and so again, how, how fencing changes depending on how demand changes. And so again, as demand increases, your optimal fenced area increases. And then as costs go up, again, the fenced, optimal fenced area goes down. So, at least we have some ranges because everything is a little bit uncertain as far as where we're doing this, um, the kind of terrain, the study site, all of those things are really uncertain. So it's good to kind of have a different range for these different parameters. So just to summarize um, all of those results. So forest conservation can offset um, the results or the losses resulting from that SGD constraint. So that was the first, the key result. If you don't do any investment, you're, you potentially will lose $12 million as soon as you put in that constraint about the seaweed, right? So um, don't do any investment, but require a strict um, growth rate for, for Limu, you're gonna lose $12 million in benefit compared to doing optimal investment in the forest 
you'll lose a little bit compared to the non-constrained case, but much less than $12 million. Um, partial fencing is optimal in most cases. So we saw that you'll always build a fence except when the fence, fencing cost is too high. If it goes something over $300 a foot, um, it no longer pays off to build a fence to protect the groundwater. Um, optimal investment will increase with the desired level of GDE protection. So that's just depending on the severity of your constraint, of your ecological constraint, um, how much you put into protecting the forest will change. Um, also, optimal investment will go down if the forest is better at capturing water. So you don't have to build as big of a fence if your fence is really good at protecting the plants that will protect more water, right? So the better your fencing is and the better the native forest is at, at, at capturing that water, then you can actually reduce your investment. And then finally, as you would imagine, your optimal investment will go up if you're going to need more water for future demand growth. So that's just kind of the whole thing in summary. And thank you very much. This is all our sponsors and um, supporters for this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Excellent presentation, as always. Um, to everyone, this is actually a very good example of a transdisciplinary work. Is that right, Kim? Because transdisciplinary yep. work right now is a very big thing here um, at the university, um, at Tineo, although mm -hmm. the sustainability science part hasn't, or Bassard hasn't caught, caught on yet. Okay, <laughs> we're now um, at this point. Should, we I, can should I stop sharing? Yes. Should I stop sharing, Ma? Okay. Okay. So we can now entertain questions. So you may. Um, Show yourself and unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, we have one actually from Jim. Jim Romaset from, Professor Jim Romaset from University of Hawaii. Are you there? Hi, Jim. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> oh, I put it on chat, but one question was, uh, is limu growth before or after limu harvesting? The growth is, is actually before. So that's growth in, in place in the ocean. Right. And so what if there's a lot of harvesting, then you won't, it'll kind of cancel out the growth. Is that a problem? Right. right. Yeah. Or? Right. We don't include as um, a control variable limu harvesting. So that's a good point that I haven't thought about before, <laughs> but right. Yeah, it's just, yeah. It kind of related to that. Um, people might think that, oh, too bad about that constraint because the present value went down. But actually, mm. the value, people have done studies on the economic value of the marine ecosystem, and it may be very high. So the complete present value is probably going up. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. That would be further further research, I guess. Yeah. Um, the other thing, just a small thing. Um, so with all the inflation we're seeing and the labor market shortages, mm -hmm. the fencing cost by 2025 may be... Mm -hmm a lot higher than it is now. And do the comparison, we may already be at that at that um, kind of threshold. So I think as, yeah, as a point of discussion, that would be, you know, doing sooner is gonna be better than later because of changes in costs. Plus the invasive species will be getting out of hand, so. Right. The return will also be less for be a given higher, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Jim. Um, okay, another question. Um, Professor RC Barisakan from PCC. Hi, Kim. Excellent, Hi, RC. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, 
in a developing country like the Philippines, uh, uh, perhaps the most pernicious uh, uh, invasive species <laughs> is population pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder how uh, um, the optimal fenced area increases, right? Because we're going to need more water later on. So we're going to have to spend more money protecting the forest, um, which is more expensive. But that's the only way it's represented here is, is kind of just through sensitivity analysis. The baseline didn't have any demand growth, but we, we varied it. And as you increase it, you have to spend more money fencing everything. Um, you know, so I mean, the way thinking about it here, it's kind of like you're protecting the forest to make sure you have enough recharge for a higher demand later on, right? Yeah, if I may follow up, uh, I guess the uh, demand growth is one, but perhaps uh, also uh, in the context of, uh, uh, of a developing country where so much uh, population pressure on the ecosystems, particularly in the, in the mm. uplands. And mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, in most cases, those uplands have uh, poorly enforced uh, property rights, you know, this, uh, so, mm. uh, so excluding uh, people who go there to make a living. Uh, so, the, so it's just not just demand growth, but also mm. I, I think- uh, I see. Uh, uh, enforcement uh, uh, issues with respect to the protection of the uplands. I see. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it's kind of taken into consideration here only because, I mean, um, part of protecting the forest is changing even what you can do in that area. So this is like would become conservation land, right? So like it can't be developed and there are different protections afforded that could potentially deal with some of that population pressure. But again, like you said, it's it's all about enforcement. I mean, on paper, it's conservation land, but whether or not that actually happens in reality depends on governance and enforcement. I think what Arcee is saying is the worst invasive species is the two-legged variety. <laughs> and, and not the kangaroos, right? And so, yeah. Instead of fencing, it might be some other mechanism, mm -hmm. some yeah. other governance mechanism. Yeah, okay. Uh, any other question from the audience? Just unmute yourself and show yourself. Um, Lina Tan, Professor Lina Tan from the Department of Economics. You may show yourself. Lina, just unmute. Yeah, I'll just unmute myself. Uh, I wrote my question, so I'm a little bit confused. Uh, isn't demand growth or the satisfaction of the demand for water a benefit rather than a cost of protection? Uh, so are you including that as part of your cost rather than the benefit of protection in your cost-benefit analysis? The sorry. I'm gonna look at it in your chat. Water demand growth, more of a benefit rather yeah. than a cost of protection. It just changes the um, amount of consumption that we're trying to meet in the future, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, right, it is a benefit mm -hmm. and not a cost of, of protection. It's just, I think what I was, what I was referring to is that the amount of fencing that's optimal will change the higher demand growth. So we're going to have to spend more, but that's better than spending money on desalination in the future. Yeah. So it is a benefit, but the optimal level of fencing and the associated cost will increase as water demand increases. Okay, and uh, as a follow-up to the question of Professor Balisakan, I guess what he is referring Considering in terms of enhancing recharge, which is adding to the stock of the groundwater, is, is changing 
basically the health of the native ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're just considering investing in protecting that and how that changes the level of groundwater. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, again, as I mentioned before, it's because you're changing the level of protection, you're not going to be able to do the things that you mentioned, like harvesting for wood or fruits or agriculture, because okay. it's going to be a protected area. So this is considered the opportunity cost of protection, right? So did you consider that? And did you consider increased uh, population growth that would increase this opportunity cost of protection? They're foregoing income because they want to protect the forest because you're fencing the forest. So people mm -hmm. are foregoing uh, income. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. There is an impact on poverty, poverty alleviation. Is yeah. that an issue in Hawaii? Because that is an important issue here in the Philippines. Yeah, that was not considered here. Mm -hmm. I mean, fencing in this particular case is only enhancing recharge, which adds to the benefit. So there is no opportunity cost of doing so that's considered explicitly. How about non-market benefits? Did you consider doing, uh, say, contingent valuation or any uh, valuation methods that would uh, measure as well the non-market values of the forest? I, I presume because you're doing uh, biodiversity, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this approach is very important. Uh, did you use such methods in your evaluation of the benefits of biodiversity, for instance? No, I mean, here it's, it's really just looking at the trade-off mm -hmm. of, you know, investing in, in, in protecting the forest, which will give you more recharge, and, and the associated groundwater dependent ecosystem. So, I mean, one, I think I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that, you know, one way to think about, um, I mean, you said, you know, non-market valuation of something like this Hawaiian native species, um, mm -hmm. this Lima species that we considered. I mean, one way to think about the, the benefit is the amount, the difference between the optimal solution with and without investment, which was about $12 million. And so that trade-off is kind of like what we're willing to trade off to protect, you know, at that growth level, at that 1.8% growth. Um, it's a way to do kind of the valuation mm -hmm. using the optimization model rather than like contingent valuation or, or another way of asking people directly how much. This is doing it instead via the management model. Mm. Okay, so in complete, add one thing there. Uh, okay, so please. Yeah, so she was talking about the amenity benefits. So if you think about the amenity benefits of the forest, mm -hmm. and it turns out that the fencing or whatever conservation measure is gives a high benefit cost ratio, mm -hmm. then the extra non-amenity benefits, which have been calculated elsewhere, mm -hmm. are sort of gravy on top of that. So okay. you could add that to the to the present value. Yeah. So in a sense, the, the amenity benefit is not yet fully estimated, right? So if but right now, as it is without computing without calculation of the this uh, other amenities, no other benefits. It's already a positive benefit, right? So that's right. That's, that's right. Yeah. Only including the water benefit. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the presentation. So we're doing a similar study. We have done a similar study uh, in the Philippines, no, but really more of this non-market valuation of uh, and water benefits as well. But we don't have the cost of uh, protection. Oh, thank you. So it's a good way, actually, right, Lina? If we yeah, yes. develop such model, but with the context of the Philippines. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Thank Any you. other question Great from comment. the audience? Are we, just unmute yourself and show yourself if you have questions. I think we have um, from somebody from DNR here. Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources. 
Any other question? Okay, I think we have a question from Facebook. Okay, hold on, let me read. Okay, 46. Uh, okay, question from Facebook. I can't read this. <laughs> Sorry. Having a... Having, and then, would a... Okay, okay, no. They're just requesting for a recording. Yes, okay, a recording will be um, mm -hmm. provided. Any other question? Uh, just a clar clarificatory question, Kim. Um, in mm -hmm. the for Dynamics, um, this is really more for the students. Um, you have there the H, right, um, to measure the stock yeah. of water. Can you expound more yeah. on that? Because you showed the different um, variables for that aquifer dynamics. So just to okay. make sure students are able to understand the stock. Sure, sure. Yeah, so for the aquifer, should I share my screen again? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, share screen. That each there? Yes. Okay, yeah, so the aquifer state variable, um, so H stands for head level. So this is kind of how how many feet above sea level um, is the, the groundwater. And so that first number is just, it's actually a conversion from um, volume to head. So this allows us to actually measure um, the difference in in, instead of just measuring the how high it is, how much water is actually there so that we can get the stock. Um, and so that's a constant. And then it's, it's multiplied with uh, natural recharge. So that's precipitation. So rainfall um, and fog and all of those other things I talked about. Um, and then minus discharge or leakage. So that's why there's that bucket. So there's water coming out um, and that's what supports the limo species in the marine ecosystem. And then Q is how much we're extracting. So every period we need to know natural recharge or rainfall, how much is leaking out in discharge and then how much we're pumping. Um, and so that's, those are the choices. Um, in, the, in the larger model, we're choosing Q, pumping, we're choosing backstop. So if we're using desal instead of the resource, and then we're choosing I or investment in the forest. So that's kind of the different variables. You, you obtain from the other discipline, just to give the audience an example that economy yeah. can also work with other scholars. Right, so I mean, so for example, that leaky bucket, so that discharge, another way we talk about is submarine groundwater discharge. So the amount of water coming out through the submarine or underground system. So there's ways that scientists on this larger team are able to measure that. So depending on salinity and other isotopes that they measure in the near shore, they can actually figure out the flow of fresh water from the aquifer into the marine system. And so that's not something that economists can identify without the help of other disciplines. And even recharge, I mean, how much, um, you know, from precipitation is actually going into the ground and then into the aquifer depends on many things like ground cover and the amount of rainfall in a specific place, kind of soil, all of those things, we don't have any idea, right? We need to work with other disciplines to really understand how to put these things together. And then, you know, extraction, we just, we just, we get data from basically the people that are managing the groundwater and look at how, you know, how much they pump and how that affects um, their water supply. So all of those things put together is how we get to use these models. Yeah, Thank, thanks Kim. So because like I said earlier, it's um, becoming a big thing in the university and we're being encouraged to work together, not only within the department, but you know, yeah. across several departments in the university. It okay. makes it way more fun too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, any other question from the students? Okay, any question? So we're already, it's already 10.59, so we're already coming at the end of this seminar. 
Um, but before we go, let me just um, give you this information that for those who are requesting for the materials of the seminar, as long as the speaker provide, give them, give us their permission, it's going to be in our website. So here it is. And um, the materials for this, for, for this morning seminar, including the recording, will be in our Facebook. And since this is um, the last seminar for this semester, let me just take this opportunity to thank our graduate student, Tweetams, Jad, and Rainier for their excellent help in organizing this seminar. And um, we're going to take a break for about two months and next semester, so I call it season two, this is the lineup of our um, guest speakers for next semester. Uh, we will be, uh, we will have Professor Kiyo Tsuka from Kobe University that will be our opening um, speaker. We have Jesus Felipe from ADB, Professor Illinois from um, Victoria University of Wellington, well-known in disaster economics, Sutad so Seth Bonsang, who is just um, elected as chairman of the board of IRI, Paolo Abarkar, who is an alumnus of Ateneo and now works at Mathematica, Houston Kwa, um, professor of economics at NTU and editor of um, Singapore Economic Review, Diwa Gunigundo, former deputy governor of BSP, Nori Terui, professor at University of Hawaii, Dean Yang, um, professor at University of Michigan and also an alumnus of Ateneo, and Sarah Gracie from University of Groningen, also an alumna of Ateneo de Manila University Economics Department. So now um, we're coming at the end of this seminar. It's time now to have our photo session with our speaker.